Okay, um, welcome everybody to the Academy of Ideas Education Forum online. Um, my name is Harley Richardson. I um, hope you can all hear me. I'm one of the forum organisers, uh, but for my day job, I work in online education publishing. And I'm also the parent of a 15 year old who's currently attempting to study at home with, it has to be said, mixed results. Uh, but it's very good to see so many new as well as familiar faces uh, before me in this uh, wonderful gallery view. Um, and uh, I can see that people are joining all the time. So uh, we'll uh, um, hopefully, uh, well, we'll see how many we get, but we're expecting uh, somewhere towards uh, 80 to 90 people to turn up. Um, and for those of you who haven't attended an education forum event before, we're um, part of the Academy of Ideas which aims to encourage intelligent, open and rigorous debate in lots of different ways it does that. Uh, the Education Forum is one of them and it's been running for over 15 years. It's made up of teachers and parents and ac uh, academics and students, and basically anyone with an interest in education. And we meet at least every half a term to get to grips or at least try to get to grips with trends in education policy and practice in hopefully a collegiate fashion. Uh, we also organise a strand of debates at the Academy's annual Battle of Ideas Festival and we have um, a monthly column in Teach Secondary magazine, um, which you might want to check out. So we usually meet in person in central London, but that's not possible tonight for obvious reasons. Happily, however, it does mean we can welcome people from further afield who can't usually attend. I see we have at least one person dialing in from uh, Australia where it's the middle of the night. So as this crisis is affecting people around the world, it will be great to hear some global perspectives. Uh, so I've put everyone on mute for the moment, um, almost everyone, I can hear a few noises um, creeping in, but don't worry, there will be plenty of opportunity to speak during the next uh, 90 minutes or so. Uh, as you I think you will know, tonight's topic is digital pedagogy and the corona classroom. We're discussing this because with schools and um, colleges unceremoniously closing for many, for most students a few weeks ago, uh, um, teachers, pupils and parents who effectively found themselves in the midst of a population wide experiment in online learning. Right now it's an experiment without an end date, at least in the UK. So one question we might want to consider is why has it taken a crisis for this to happen? At least as far back as the 1920s and the invention of the Pressy automated testing machine, there have been hopes that technology would transform education. In the two decades I've worked in the ed tech industry, I've lost, not, lost track of the number of times I've heard people claim that digital technology would solve education's problems. Technology was supposed to allow children to take control of their own education, and reduce the workload of teachers, just, just for starters. So I don't think that vision has come to pass yet, but maybe this is EdTech's moment. What can we learn from the crisis? Is there room in an online environment for the informal elements of education? How are teachers and pupils adapting to the experience? And are there any innovations that we might want to preserve when we return to normal school life? So I'm hoping we'll hear about people's experiences, both good and bad. Let's see where the conversation takes us. Can kick things off, we have two great speakers who will get the discussion started. Firstly, we have Donald Clark, who is an EdTech entrepreneur with over 30 years in the online uh, learning experience in the online learning business. He's the CEO of several companies, including Wildfire and Cogbooks. But he's more than just a tech guy. Just this week, he completed an online series of 100 learning theorists in 100 days. Well worth checking out. I'll post the <laughs> URL for his blog in the chat box in a minute. And secondly, we have Toby Marshall, who's a user of EdTech. Um, he teaches film studies and other subjects at schools and colleges in Essex and East London. He's a long-standing member of the Education Forum Committee, as well as co-producer of this session. So we're going to stick to our normal format as far as possible. That means Donald and Toby will both speak for five to seven minutes each, then we'll go out to the audience. Um, and I'll run through how we're going to take audience contributions then. If you hear a big clunk at any point, that may be my jerry-rigged video camera setup um, collapsing. Uh, this is an experiment for us at the Education Forum too, so please bear with us if there are any technical hip hiccups. So I'm just going to uh, see if I can um, take Donald off mute and uh, just bear with this while I remute everybody else. Okay, uh, can everyone hear me okay? A little nod here and there? Good stuff. Okay, 
Well, let me let me start by saying, you know, that's right. I've spent actually 35 years in this sort of, you know, technology and learning game. And then suddenly, in the blink of an eye, parents and teachers were actually forcing their kids to take oodles of screen time. Uh, that was a little bit confusing for young people, I suspect, as the poachers suddenly became gamekeepers. But even though I've been a big advocate for technology and learning, I, I want to start with a, an observation in that I think after the closing down of schools by the authorities, uh, we did something that really was quite wrong here, leaving the schools to just get on with it, almost abandoning them, the DFE in particular. I would much rather that we didn't teach kids online in this period. I think we should have been thinking creatively about the solution, bringing the Easter and summer holidays forward, letting parents, many of them frontline workers, relax with their kids, not forcing this artificial school in the home environment for everyone. We could have brought the holidays forward and then got them back to school and got on with teaching, even if that meant delaying the first term of the university term, shunting that forward to the summer of 2021. But all we did was fall off the cliff in a sense. And I think this has been an interesting experience, but what can we learn from this? You know, that's what's happened. Let's live with that and see what we can learn from it. I mean, necessity is the, the mother of innovation, as it were. Uh, but I think a lot of people were really wrong-footed pedagogically here. And that, of course, was most exemplified by this University of Zoom. You know, everybody rushed to this medium in a desperate attempt to mimic what they do in the classroom on a screen. And yet we have 30 years of experience of doing this, saying that's the last thing you should be doing. There are plenty, you know, this is a different medium. It's not easy controlling 30 individual people with full feedback by just talking at a screen. So we had this, the eponymous Zoom, you know, Zoom being rushed. Everybody fell off the cliff into Zoom. And then of course we had the predictable backlash uh, where people were suddenly worrying about the, uh, the privacy issues in Zoom and people were getting Zoom bombed. That was mostly pranks by kids. It was mostly teachers not knowing how to use privacy and password settings in Zoom. Remember, Zoom didn't ask for this. Suddenly, 200 million people were using a piece of software that was never designed for the purpose of teaching. It was largely a corporate meeting uh, tool. So in a sense, Zoom was the wrong thing to do. You know, get on and lecture at kids uh, in this type of software. However, the, you know, what should have happened, and I, I think what started to happen when people realized that lecturing people <laughs> wasn't quite the right thing to do because you're at a distance in a sense, that in a way you're not in a classroom, is that you have to adjust. And first of all, don't go all anti-tech. You have to get the communications right with young people. You know, they're all okay with the technology. They know what this stuff is. So you have to sort of hide your anti-tech sentiments <laughs> in a sense and just communicate, get to know who's got the kit, who's not, What's the most appropriate tools? You really have to do your homework before suddenly teaching. But I felt that people rushed into the teaching without having done the preparation. Also, the sort of language of online classrooms is a bit odd. It's not a classroom. A lecturer or lecturer, you're not lecturing people. This is a different medium. It's a medium where you don't slam out lots of links and talk at people. In fact, in many ways, the online medium is a medium where sort of less is more. You have to, funnily enough, do less than you do in the classroom. Uh, it's not as if, as I hardly said, it's not as if we haven't done this before. You know, we had, uh, we've had millions of people go through online, full degrees online, without ever met their tutors or other students. I've been heavily involved in that for many years. It's not people don't learn online. It's just very, very different. And I feel that schools were massively unprepared for this. Those that didn't have a virtual learning environment or LMS, didn't have an expert in the school whom you could turn to, didn't really know what tools they should be using. Should it be Google, Microsoft tools? But the big mistake going back to Zoom was that people went for synchronous learning, you know, as if the kids should be there in real time while you talked at them. Whereas actually asynchronous or non-real time activity is where most of the focus should have gone. Uh, so the single biggest mistake in learning is usually, you know, Zoom, Skype, uh, the image of the talking head, Actually, when you're teaching, we've learned a lot about how to avoid talking heads in online learning. If you go to Khan Academy and you're learning maths, you don't see Salman Khan. You actually see the maths on the screen. So the talking head is not actually, it's mostly cognitive noise. It's good for introducing things, for giving feedback perhaps, talking and tailing. But when you're teaching maths, as I have, you have to show the maths. Get rid of the face. The face 
doesn't add anything when you're deep in the deep thought of solving a mathematical problem. Uh, I think beyond that, you know, it's not as if kids don't learn at home. You give them homework, a horrible word, by the way, homework as if it were some sort of chore. That's how kids see homework as a chore by and large. But this is different. You really have to give them real guidance on the type of feedback. You've got to quantify the task. Be really clear about the task. How many words you've got to, they've got to give you? In what format? Real detail and deadlines as well. But of course, what people miss from the classroom is really the sort of human side of feedback. Even there though, you have to switch your techniques. Don't imagine that you're gonna give individualized feedback unless you've got good adaptive learning software to 30 people simultaneously, it's not gonna happen. To be honest, it doesn't happen in the classroom either. It never happens in a classroom. If you're teaching 30 kids maths, there's no way you're cognitively diagnosing 30 people in real time as you're teaching. But the switch towards high retention techniques, things like retrieval practice, space practice, can be done online in a way that they cannot be done in a classroom. If you change your whole pedagogy towards the affordances that online have to offer, then suddenly a new world opens up, not the world of the classroom, but the world where online actually has some advantages over the classroom. Uh, you know, retrieval practice, space practice, lots of cognitive science around that sort of stuff that you can look at in, into later, no doubt. And then also the continuity, having a schedule, sticking to that schedule and so on. So I think people panicked and didn't really pick up on the, on the, on the stuff they should have picked up. But there's some nice lessons we've learned already looking at the feedback. One is that parents have become a wee bit more involved in their kids' education. And I think maybe gained a new respect for teachers, certainly, you know, uh, the behavioral problems that a teacher faces. I think many parents have faced that as well, the problems of motivation and behavior. So perhaps the relationship between teachers and schools and parents will be different as we go forward here. And of course, parents have also had their minds opened up to resources that they can help their kids with. You know, if, if I got stuck in maths, my, neither of my parents could help me. But now we have Khan Academy, Hegarty, lots of things online where now that parents are aware of these resources, they can perhaps support the online learning in a way they didn't before. So more power to the parents. Certainly teachers have had to be upskilled, and that's a good thing. Teacher training has been appalling in this area by barely mentioning technology, barely mentioning it, despite the fact that almost everybody who leaves school will be using it in the workplace and in their life for entertainment and communications as we are now. That's an appalling dereliction of duty, I think, really. So I think this opening up and awareness of the tools, by it's been a crash course, of course, and we cannot blame the teachers for this, but uh, it's been a sort of experiential learning course for many teachers. Another lesson, interestingly, is this opening up of content. You know, we, you suddenly became, suddenly many parents and teachers are aware of the fact that they don't have to come up with their own content uniquely in every lesson. There is good online content out there that takes the workload off teachers. In maths, Khan Academy, Integrity Maths, Duolingo, all well, their BBC resources, they rose to the plate a little bit here by providing lots of resources. The difficult thing is personalized feedback and adaptive content. And this is where the UK and Europe are miles behind. So we have Squirrel and massive AI companies doing this on scale in China, full personalized feedback and adaptive content until we catch up we will always be behind, but I fear that we haven't really looked at that in any detail in the UK. Most of the action is either the US or in China. So I think teaching is king, but content is queen. You know, I think the fact that there is good online content, kids use this in homework all the time. They use YouTube all the time, they use Google all the time, they use Wikipedia all the time. They're used to that sort of stuff. I think learning at home will, in a sense, get out of this homework, you know, design a poster or all that hokey stuff that every parent gets and goes, is this homework really? Perhaps this is, you know, maybe, you know, we've all as teachers raised our game here to realize that homework could be a much more sophisticated thing in terms of online learning. And perhaps we can start using the, the technology for marking and feedback. We can't as teachers complain about workload and then refuse to use technology for automating the things we don't like doing. So surely we should pedagogically move towards using the tech to do things that can be done well by the tech. And perhaps the leadership teams in schools should really focus on having a digital strategy rather than the sort of ad hoc adjunct approach they have to technology. Uh, I think CPD, interestingly, Twitter has exploded with teachers really doing the sort of CPD that you never get in an inset day. You know, learning from practitioners and online learning 
people have been generous with their time and advice, I think. Maybe that has brought people on looking at CB, CPD through different eyes. Uh, and of course, those are the learners. This is what it's all about. Teaching is a means to an end, never an end in itself. And I think they've been forced. And maybe it's interesting. I was speaking to my niece today, and she felt that she got more done because she was in lockdown, <laughs> almost an enforced learning. Uh, she had lots of time in her hands. She could focus. It was quiet. So I think learners, you know, are more adaptable than we than we may think. But of course, let's not be too positive about this because there's the big issue of equity. Kids who don't have access to the internet at the bandwidth we need at home. Uh, you know, this is no doubt going to arise in the discussion. But coming back to the establishment, you know, I really think it's been a, a mistake that we got rid of BECTA, the educational establishment, the DFE, the quality assurance bodies, Ofsted, are ridiculously negative about the use of technology and learning. Ridiculously negative. It's as if people can only ever learn in a classroom, which has always been a false premise. In fact, throughout my life, I've learned hardly anything in a classroom. I haven't been on a course. I haven't encountered a teacher for 40 years. That's not to say I haven't learned anything. So I think we have to be a bit careful about this premise that all teaching takes place in classrooms we're clearly going to go forward with some sort of blend uh, uh, here where we'll have a, an increased respect for online learning. So I'll end there. I, I should add one thing. I think much bigger changes will happen in higher education. I think there will be massive changes there just because of the fiscal pressure. But for schools, we'll all go back to school, but we'll have a new respect and a, a new approach that includes online learning as part of the mix. Great, thank you for that. And for those who don't know, Bechter, you mentioned Bechter, but Bechter was um, the British Educational uh, Communications Technology Agency. It was a quango that was responsible for things like trying to get every um, every pupil in the country onto a learning platform. And, that, and they were shut down as one of the first acts of the coalition government in 2010-11, I think, as part of the bonfire of the quangos. But uh, thanks for that. So. Um, have schools been abandoned to online um, without enough preparation? Uh, so, Toby, I'm going to now um, unmute you, and it's uh, over to yourself. Hello, uh, hello, everyone. Um, good evening, uh, and uh, thank you, Donald, for that introduction. I thought it was most interesting. I think um, many, many um, areas of overlap um, in uh, our thinking. I think. Um, so I, I might be reinforcing some of those points you made. I think maybe the point of disagreement might be, uh, not really disagreement, but a stress on, um, uh, or a difference in the significance we attribute um, to the classroom. So that might be one thing to have to think about uh, as I'm presenting. So uh, I'm an A-level teacher. I've been teaching for 20 years in East London and Essex. Um, mostly I've taught film studies, um, but over the years, I've turned my hand to other subjects, including media and um, sociology. Uh, my interest in online education probably arose from the space between those subjects. Um, but uh, I'm, also, I mean, I'm also an enthusiast and one of the first wave of home gamers. In fact, I'm so ancient um, that I can remember loading up games using basic commands and cassette tapes on my Commodore 64. I'll just see if anyone recognizes that, but some people do. Uh, so that's how long I've just been a kind of enthusiast a little bit, um, but, but not a programmer or any of those kinds of things. Um, so I do think, uh, so I won't be offering any technical um, or technological uh, answers to questions. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to throw out three provocations um, to uh, get people thinking about this um, that derived from my teaching experience. Uh, and if I'm being a bit one-sided in this, that's just to um, stimulate um, the discussion. So my first provocation is IT cannot compensate for education. Uh, my second is, uh, and I think Donald and I are in agreement on this, there is no such thing as an online classroom. Um, and my third point is that the home is not a school. Um, so. Uh, before I explain things, I just want to clarify a little bit of my mood. Uh, I do think we're living in exceptional times. There's a lot of fear about and anxiety, um, but we are in the midst of an exciting experiment at the same time. Um, and I just think there's lots to learn and teachers are working very hard to make the best out of a very bad and challenging situation. Um, 
but as I said, there's much to learn and we should keep an open mind. Um, what is clear um, in my mind is that every day that schools are closed is a day lost to ignorance. Um, and in my thinking on this, I, I owe a great debt to the work of the sociologist, uh, Michael Young, who argues persuasively, in my view, that schools are specialized social institutions um, that uniquely provide the next generation with access to what he calls powerful knowledge. Um, schools, he argues, do this best when they have strong institutional boundaries between themselves and the outside world, um, as boundaries enable specialization. Um, and I'm going to come back to the idea of boundaries um, at the end of my presentation. Um, so I just want to say one more thing before I explain uh, my provocations, and I suppose that's to state the obvious, which is that we're in a historically unique situation uh, where teachers cannot be physically proximal to their students. Um, and I think we should all be honest about this and, and accept that we don't know the consequences of this. Um, but I don't think you need a research from Google to tell you that this is going to have big implications um, for discipline. Um, so this brings me to my first provocation. Um, so the first one is IT cannot compensate for education. Um, IT, in my view, has been massively oversold, ironically, to the detriment of the cause of IT in education. And one of the um, the central problem here, I think, is that technology cannot compensate for the wider problems of our educational culture. Um, a bad pedagogic idea or practice is a bad idea online or off. Um, and indeed, it's all too easy to feel that we're being creative and innovative and meaningful in our teaching simply because it takes a digital form. Um, currently, we're all desperately trying to find a digital solution to a pressing social problem. And I think I'd go with Donald on this. Uh, we should have reorganized the school year and just said, look, nothing's happening, maybe. That might have been the best thing to do uh, to give us all time to work out a strategy. But I think in this context, it's very easy to make a fetish of the technology. Now that might be psychologically gratifying to take action, um, but it's no substitute for critical reflection and judgment. Um, so, I think it's especially important at this moment to distinguish our educational ideals, our theories, our practices, and then the communicative means by which we seek to realize them. Um, if we can get the former straight, um, then we can usefully think about the latter. My second provocation um, is that there's no such thing as an online classroom. I think it would be tempting to uh, conclude that technology simply expresses our values and provides a neutral context uh, or online space which can replicate the dynamics of the classroom. And I agree with Donald. Um, I just don't think this is true. Um, the way that we use digital technology will tend to give expression to our existing uh, educational culture, but in doing so, technology also provides us with something new. Um, ultimately, technology can even become a culture in itself. Um, now, I'd hold that if no two things are identical, um, then really we need a better name for our activity online than an online classroom, because that's misleading. Um, for me, they're simply different, maybe inferior, maybe superior, but that depends on what we want to do with these spaces. Um, and obviously here, it's really important to move, to avoid sweeping generalizations, because there's many different platforms and many different packages. Uh, and we shouldn't, uh, and I think again, I agree with Donald here, um, set up false choices. Um, we, uh, you know, we want, options and choices and as many things as possible. It's not an either or. Um, but I do think there are important differences between digital and non-digital learning. Um, and I think maybe where I differ from Donald is I'm going to make a more sustained defense of classroom teaching, um, not to the exclusion of digital stuff, but um, just to kind of highlight why I think that's important. So the first thing is physical proximity. Um, physical proximity is important as it encourages discipline. Um, and it also encourages intense engagement. Um, what is so powerful about a live social gathering is it offers all participants a measure of freedom, a point that was made clear to me by an ex-colleague uh, just this week. He described, and he, was, uh, he had difficulties at school. He ended up just in the library because they couldn't, um, he wouldn't fit into the classroom, but he, made, he gave a, a beautiful portrait of all the forms of communication that take place in the classroom. Um, you know, the notes being passed, the ironic gesture, the shrug of the shoulders. It's a very open and dynamic, for me, uh, community, context, uh, community context 
in which actually pupils ex exercise a high degree of agency, ir uh, irrespective of uh, teacher supervision. And as all teachers know, the authority of the teacher is earned um, and highly provisional rather than programmed. And at any one moment, the attention of the pupil or indeed the whole class can go its merry way. Um, in addition to this, the classroom is also semiotically rich and flexible with multiple pathways, channels, and associated sign and forms. Of course, online classrooms, if we must use this term, can't, can replicate some of this, um, but they necessarily do so in a mediated and therefore controlled and controlling fashion. Um, consider this context. Harley, if I'm boring you, you can switch me off. Um, if, we were, if we were sitting right next to each other, you'd have to ask me very politely. So there's a very different situation uh, online and offline. Um, and I don't know, you know maybe technology could um, be used in a different way, um, but it tends to have this programmed channeled kind of set of pathways. Um, and uh, I think I prefer something a bit riotous, a bit more riotous anyway, but you know, I am teaching humanities subjects, maybe that's part of what I do. Um, so my third provocation is a home is not school. Um, and this brings us back to the issue of boundaries. Um, here I'd like to look at Young's point about the school and college, but from a different angle. Schools and colleges are not the only agents of socialization or indeed the most important in my view. Um, families play the primary role in socializing the young. And I feel strongly that educators should respect the autonomy of families, just as we expect parents to respect our professional judgment and um, autonomy. Um, this point is important as many parents I've been speaking to, who particularly have younger kids, um, are facing a landslide of expectations with regards to um, homeschooling. As such, some schools have, in my view, crossed over a boundary between the school um, and the home. I remember an ex-colleague of mine telling me that they had politely informed their child's school that they would be no longer doing any work set um, for their child at home. This was a few years ago. Uh, and I remember at the time, um, she actually was my boss, uh, thinking, well, this is a bit crackers. She's kind of mad radical feminist. Um, but having had three kids um, and uh, coming out the other side of that, I, I actually have come to admire my colleague's stance of just saying, my home is my home. I do this in my home. I do what I want to do in my home. Um, so I think home is home, school is school. Teachers teach, parents parents. Uh, both ought to uphold each other's work. It, it's not a competition between the two. It's a, ideally adults are united in um, this thing, but they should be respectful of the division of labor there. Home, like the school, is a specialized social context, which like the school um, seeks to nurture the next generation. However, life within the home is quite unlike the school. It is more spontaneous, it's convivial, it's unconditionally effective, uh, affectionate sometimes. Um, it's directionless in character, it's pointless, there's digressions, there's whimsy, um, narrative, it's not analysis. Um, teachers, in particular those in leadership positions, need to take care, in my view, that they don't just try and reconfigure the home as an adjunct of the classroom. Uh, so my conclusion is, um, IT cannot compensate for education. There is no such thing as an online classroom. Home is not the school, um, but my key point um, is we need to keep an open mind and we've all got a great deal to learn in a difficult, but actually quite exciting situation. Thank you, Toby. Um, your description of the sort of difference between class and home just reminded me, I'm actually a bit of a veteran of Zoom in um, online context um, in the company I used to work for. Uh, we used to have meetings, um, all, lots of meetings every week, regular meetings with people around the world where people had to sort of um, give reports on whatever they were doing. And what people pretty much, I know I'm not the only one, used to do was, was uh, look, have the camera on, look like they're in the meeting, zone out and get on with some actual work and be listening out for your name to be called so you could come to attention and do what you needed to give your thing and then zone out of it again. So it wasn't real, a real meeting that it appeared to be. But anyway, so um, thank you both for excellent introductions. Um, we're now onto the discussion part of the, the meeting. Um, I need to say this is not a Q&A at the Education Forum. We do things slightly differently.
Um, it's an opportunity for people to respond to the speakers, to raise points or questions of their own, um, and really just to have a public discussion about this um, with uh, what Toby and Donald have said as a sort of start, starting point. Um, we want to get as many people in as we can, uh, so, you know, um, being succinct is always good, but uh, we'll, what we'll do is we'll take several people uh, before we come back for the, to the speakers um, and you can make uh, comments or questions, as I say. As you may have noticed, we are recording this session to put up on the AOI website, um, but we do want people to speak as freely as they can, so do drop us a note afterwards if there's anything you'd like edited out of your own contributions. So um, here's how to contribute. Um, if you would like to speak, you can raise your hand virtually. I can see that at least one, two people have done that already um, by going to the participants bu button um, and clicking raise hand. Now, I can't tell you exactly where to find it because it varies from uh, computer to computer. But if you look for the participants button, you should have it somewhere and then you should have uh, the option raise hand under there. Um, and then I'll be able to see that you've raised your hand virtually and when it comes to your turn I'll let you know, know and I'll unmute you so that you can talk. And if you'd like to briefly say whether you're a teacher or parent or what your interest in this topic is, that's all, all to the good. Um, and uh, I noticed we've already got people talking in the comment in the chat box as well, so feel free to make comments there. So I've got a first in my list, I've got uh, Kate moorcock Abley. I'm going to unmute you, Kate. Um, over to you. Hello, um, I'm Kate and I'm uh, an early years teacher and a parent teenager. Um, early years um, is kinetic learning. Um, it, it's based on the relationship very closely with the teacher, an extreme example, if you like. And we're doing a lot of recordings just so that they can see the teacher's face because um, I really take on board the points people have made about discipline. Um, or just, you know, in, and engagement, which are um, in, inextricably linked um, in the early years. And the, the point is, it is easier to be disciplined and engage children in a classroom when they're all together. There is a herd mentality. Um, and you can also read the room when you're teaching. And you can differentiate there and then um, and uh, teach much more effectively. Um, so everything we're doing is um, in, on these wonderful online platforms, doing beautiful videos, linking them to all sorts of extracurricular activities, blah, 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 blah. Um, it's not the same as being in the class. Um, and hopefully that will um, evolve as we are able to build up a closer relationship with the parents. And it's not fair on the parents. Parents are the parents. Many of them are working from home, for goodness sake. Um, and it does, I think it ruins the relationship um, because parenting isn't about saying um, between six and seven, you will blah, blah, blah. It is about saying, why don't you blah, blah, blah when you've done blah, 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 uh, if you are interested. And it's a, it ruins your relationship with your child. My, um, but speaking as uh, the mother of a teenager who's um, just in his first year of A-levels, yeah, um, it's fine. Um, they get content in various forms. They have phone calls with their teacher um, to um, overcome the problem that many children face, which is that in order to do online learning in a household with, say, two or three children, you need two or three decent devices and brilliant um, internet, um, which does um, exclude and uh, um, um, it's not fair on, on quite a lot of kids. It, it actually exacerbates the already um, existing divisions. Um, so I'm not uh, a, big, a big fan, I suppose, is the answer. I do think it will be great fun for all sorts of different homeworks once the schools reopen. Um, but it doesn't seem to appeal uh, either in early years or, or in secondary. But they need each other to talk to as well. There's no, there's no, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, the zone of proximal development, as they say, is social. It's done between kids with a nod and a wink as they get older. 
but yeah, sorry, I've stopped talking. Thank you. Thank you, that's great. Uh, and it's worth pointing out, if it's not already been pointed out already, that obviously a lot of the systems that are being used were ones that are already being used by, for typically more by secondary or upper primary for setting of homework. And I, I've been wondering, looking at how it's worked with my, our own son and what his school is doing about how much teachers have kind of got just transplanted that to rather than a couple of hours a day to uh, being a sort of a train, attempting to fill it out to the, the full school day and whether that actually is appropriate at all. So we've got coming up, we've got next Alistair Donald and then Susan Parlor, but uh, Alistair, you're unmuted. Okay, thanks. And thanks, Donald and Toby. That was uh, both, re both really interesting presentations and lots to think about. Um, I think, uh, Toby, I'm, I'm kind of naturally quite sympathetic to, to much of the stuff that you're saying. But um, we're in this situation just now. Uh, these tools are being uh, forced on us to some extent. They're giving us new opportunities to try and work things out. So I suppose my, my sort of instinct is, um, should we be a bit more open to exploring the opportunities that they present? And so I, 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 on a couple of things that you were talking about, so the proximity thing as, as part of the, you know, when you were saying there's no such thing as a classroom. I mean, surely, yeah, I mean, yes, I get it that, that kind of um, having physical proximity is, is a much easier way to interact. But surely part of the establishing of authority is an intellectual authority as well. And we shouldn't diminish that aspect of it. And, and um, by looking to establish a greater intellectual authority, then maybe perhaps in, in these circumstances, we can start to overcome some of the limitations of not having the, the physical proximity. And the second thing is, is just in terms of the, the situation in the home. I mean, is it, you know, lots of, people work from home and it's a, I mean, I hate it. I, I mean, I'd, I'd much rather be in an office, but in a situation where I've got to work from home, then what you do is you go about creating a situation where you can get by. So you shut yourself off in a room, you measure out the time, you, you do all, put in place all these artificial boundaries that can best um, uh, create a situation where, you know, you, you, you're at work. So is it not possible that in, in a situation like that, that we can also start to do this in an, in an educational sense as well? So I, I suppose my question is, are, are we just, are you giving in a little bit too easily? Because when, you know, when Kate says things like um, you, 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 need, uh, you need certain sorts of devices or you need, uh, um, a certain amount of cer certain conditions then I mean if, if, if you go to school to physical school you don't you don't accept that the school won't buy textbooks you say give us some more money to buy proper textbooks so give us some more money to buy proper devices I mean are we just not being a bit too easy to give into this I suppose is my question thanks um, so next we have uh, oh we've just vanished off the list um, we had a couple of people had their hands up, but they've now taken them down. Um, so uh, Joan Nutt, I think, would like to go next, and then Joan Fogel. So Joe, jo, you are unmuted. Uh, hi, Harley, everybody. Uh, right, what interests me about this is I think people haven't quite grasped the scale of what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, you, know, you know, several people said already that uh, the sort of pressure that technology businesses and organizations have put on education for years and the agenda that's behind all that. Well, the coronavirus has triggered an extraordinary level of really rapid activity behind the scenes. And if you look at what the OECD are doing, they're using this opportunity as, they've, as the absolute gift from heaven, because they see it as their opportunity to completely change the future of schooling. And You know, this is a fantastic opportunity and you will not stop the momentum. And that's what really interested me. And if you look at the organisations that are involved, they're all there. They're all the big names you'd expect. Uh, and they've been energised like no other time. In all the time I've worked in the industry, I've seen all sorts of initiatives. I've not seen anything like this. Uh, it's a, a really a serious, I think it's a serious question. And it's not being widely aired. That's my worry.
Thank you, Joe. Uh, and next we have Joan Fogel. Hi. Muted. Hello. I'm not Hi, a parent Joe. and I'm not a, a working teacher. But I noticed on the chat that Jill, as Jill, somebody said the children are enjoying it. My question is what people are picking up from, from the children, how, whatever age, about what feedback they're getting and what they're hearing from their own children about this process. I think it's all very interesting what's going on. And um, I, I'd like to hear a bit about that. Thanks. Uh, we'll take Susan Parlor and then um, go back to uh, Donald and uh, Toby, I think. So. Okay, right. Um, well, I, I work in Northern Ireland and I'm a head of English and um, basically I've been working for over 20 years and I'm a big fan of technology. Um, but what I found was that we have been thrown to the wolves to some degree where we have been given platforms which are not fit for purpose. We have got, we've got Edmodo and uh, Google Classroom. And nobody, we had to upstart from scratch and basically upload everything from home. And uh, the kids didn't know what they were doing. So consequently, when you teach 150 kids, you have just all these messages coming at you. I don't think there's any real learning um, going on. I think that well, what we have in, in these, they, I, was, I, I do agree that it's not a classroom, certainly isn't a classroom is um, forums where I can send out work, written work, uh, comes back to me and I get just a tsunami of work to be marked online. Um, so I, I just think for at this particular time that no learning is taking place. Zoom here, we've been advised by our unions that we're not to engage in Zoom with under 16s. Um, so which is, yeah. Uh, safeguarding for uh, children and to protect uh, members. That's all uh, three unions, I think. Yeah. So I did I, I try to engage with um, my A level because they're over 16, but uh, they, they didn't engage. So I do find it very difficult to try to teach concepts um, such as poetry at, at that level by just kind of, you know, sending out stuff. Um, just finding it difficult to have resorted to making my own podcasts, you know, to teach, to replicate in some way the way I would deliver in the classroom. But um, I just find that it's not fit for purpose, that we've been given this kind of um, task, go online, here's your classroom. And it, it just needs a lot of refining. I hope that when we come out the other side of this, that we will actively kind of have the time to kind of look at these forums and see where can we go with these forums? Because I think, yes, they do actually have potential, but, you know, there's just a, a lot of work to be done. It's just my... Yeah. Thanks. Um, and uh, so I, I think it's interesting. I mean, it, one of the things that's come out of this is that there's um, an awful lot of online resources um, out there been made available by people at the BBC and um, museums and so on. And... Uh, um, as well as a lot of the online resource company, online companies, the learning platforms and, and online resources have made their stuff at least free, at least temporarily. It's, I'd be interested to know whether people uh, 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 have been using any of that or whether there's any sort of more, any positive things that the people are finding out of this experience. Um, but keep putting your hands up and keep an eye on the list. But Donald, um, if I can just find you in the list, your hand's gone down for some reason. Um, if you could uh, come back and pick up on anything out of what people have said that you'd like to say, you don't have to respond to everything. I don't think it would be possible, but whatever you points you'd like to make of this sure. stage. Yeah, I think everyone's agreed that we shouldn't fetishize the technology and the online thing, but there's a danger of fetishizing classrooms as well. And, you know, I have a friend, Martin Dugimas, he founded Moodle and uh, he didn't go to school. He, uh, he did the school over there in Australia. Super smart guy, had a brilliant education. It's not as if we haven't done this before. And this idea that you need a classroom to socialize kids, I think is completely false. I don't think classrooms socialize kids that much. In fact, working teachers report huge amounts of disruption and behavioral problems in classrooms because Judith Harris has researched this inside out because of the peer pressure, distractions and so on. Uh, the idea that the classroom is an ideal socialization mechanism, I think has always been wrong. It 
does to a degree, but it's not really a place for socialization. Most teachers spend most of the time trying to stop kids socializing in the wrong way. And remember kids, when they step out of the classroom, socialize every three minutes, every three minutes of their waking life on social media. There are no slouches when it comes to socialization. So I, you know, I don't really buy this idea that, that uh, my kids were socialized because they sat in classrooms. Uh, in fact, they couldn't wait. I could, I, I'm quite a bookish kid. And I went to a very rough school, but there was a lot of disruption. And I had to do a lot of learning on my own at home. And throughout my life, I've done a lot of learning in the, in, you know, in the quiet of my own home and at two big universities, but really not in lectures, but in the quiet of the library and so on and so forth. So I love classrooms. I don't, wouldn't want to get rid of classroom schools and teachers, but let's not fetishize the classroom as the only place that people get socialized or learn. I think this is completely wrong. And I go back to some of those comments about the family being an important context for this as well. You know, I didn't learn character and morals from my teachers. I learned it from my parents and my relatives. And so I think there's a great danger here that we think schools do everything. I don't think they do everything in a sense. You know, we, we have to be a bit wary of idolizing of what is essentially a Victorian model, <laughs> which we've stuck to for a long, long time. And there's interesting research. If you look back to pre-classroom here, if you look at the research by Bloom, for example, where he just took kids, same learning, one-to-one -one tuition, outperforms classroom kids by two standard deviations. So there are alternatives here. And I think the idea that the excuse for classrooms is classrooms do wonderful things, but socializing kids is not one of them, I feel. Sorry, I was on mute. This keeps this is the, the mute, um, mute juggling fest. Uh, Toby, I'm just unmuting you, but thank you, Donald, for that. Yep. Um, there you go. Um, yes, uh, very interesting um, uh, discussion. Just to come back on the um, classroom. Um, I mean, I, I think you know the the, the classroom experience um, is a struggle. Uh, and I'm actually a big defender of home education. If, if parents decide that's the way that is best for their kid, then I, I would defend that, right? I think that's important. And there are autodidacts. There are true mavericks that just don't fit into the system. Uh, and I'm all for, uh, I think we've got a duty to accommodate that. Um, but I actually think the normal pathway, the typical pathway is through the classroom and I think the struggle is the project um, the contestation the argument that's all part of the vital experience um, that we uh, go through uh, in a collective intellectual endeavor which is uh, what the classroom um, represents um, on Alice's point about authority um, being intellectual not physical um, I wish um, I mean, I think, you know, the, the authority being intellectual is the outcome of the process. That's when you've won, um, that they recognize your authority intellectually. Um, but there's, you know, it, it, that's a long pathway and there's all kinds of chivying and all kinds of techniques and emotional tactics and persuasion and propaganda and all kinds of things we will use to, uh, cont you know, c curtail stuff and keep people on a path. And uh, I think that's really kind of the, uh, outcome, but I absolutely 100% endorse what Alistair is saying. We are where we are. Um, technology offers a great uh, potential way of um, responding to this situation. It would be professionally negligent of us to not do anything because, as I said in my introduction, every day that we don't teach is a victory for ignorance. Um, you know, schools were uh, the welfare state, etc. Ignorance is one of the great evils. Um, and um, that's why schools exist. And that's why people spend a lot of tax money on schools. So we have to try and do something. And on, on the positive, I've, I've had um, some, some great experiences with my students. I have to say it's the more engaged, the already more engaged, more uh, committed students. Um, so we've been watching films on the iPlayer and then discussing them on Teams. So we did uh, 12 Monkeys. Um, 
and uh, a Singaporean film about an executioner. And we had a fantastic uh, discussion on teams after watching it. And, and, and that worked really well. And in fact, I kind of concluded that my more able students liked me remotely at a distance. Um, so they, they seem to be getting a lot out of the uh, experience. So I, I don't think we should be anti-tech. Uh, I do think we should be flexible. Um, I do think there's a, a, a typical pathway, which is the collective enterprise of the live uh, classroom. Um, but uh, yeah, we've got to grab the ball by the horns and do something. Um, we don't know how long this is last. I mean, I, it might be a scare story on um, AOL. They love to put these mad banner headlines on AOL. When I check my email, they're, they're talking about three waves of this. So this could go on for a long, long time. What are we going to do? Just not educate kids for the next year? I mean, when are we going to get a vaccine? I mean, we may never get a vaccine. We can't just assume there's going to be a vaccine. So, uh, you know, we have to respond as professionals in the situation we are. I just think a little bit of um, uh, respect for, you know, for parents. I, I'm not saying that teachers aren't doing that. I just think uh, I, I've, I've spoken to a lot of parents that are really feeling the stress. And I endorse what Kate said, which is there is an entirely different set of moral principles that apply uh, and discursive practices when you're a parent um, than when you're a teacher. I mean, as a teacher, I've got a target. You know, I'm getting something out of the situation. I've got a concept which I want them to walk away understanding. Um, uh, you know, by the end of the session, as a parent, um, you know, who knows? It's spontaneous, isn't it? We, you know, just go with the flow at home. Um, and so I'm just, I, I'm just raising that as an issue. Yeah, and we don't, um, you're quite right, we don't know when schools will go back over here. People, I don't know if people noticed though that Denmark, um, they've started a phased uh, reopening of um, primary schools and nurseries uh, today, in fact, but we'll see whether that, sets a trend or not so we've got a list of people now building up who'd like to speak um so next we have sarah hume and after that claire fox and derek robertson uh sarah you're unmuted hi can, can you hear me yeah thanks yeah. hi um lovely to see everyone i'm really enjoying the discussion um i'm coming at it from multiple perspectives, I suppose. So number one, as a parent of three young children, so this is two of them at primary school and one two-year-old, and also working in higher education and trying to manage all of the demands that that brings. And it is uncharted territory and very, very uncertain. One of the things that I'm interested in um, as a lecturer and a researcher is the ideas of uncertainty that surround us in our practice and how we either um, make use of them to be creative or how we fall into certainty all the time. And I was interested in what you were saying, Toby, about um, schools and home being institutionalized, that they're institutionalized and they have, they're very strongly boundaried. And I think that one of the things that we have, um, we're kind of in danger of at the moment is falling into um, the kind of, the more certain practices. So. The online classroom as soon as the um, university shut down and stopped teaching the my colleagues and I instantly thought how can we lecture online how can we do how can we deliver the content online how can we do what we're doing in the same way but online and I'm just reflecting now as to whether that's actually helpful or unhelpful because when we're in these kind of uncertain spaces or liminal spaces we seek the certainty which is what we already know and what we've already gone before with but this is all merging now. We're in such an uncertain space that I kind of I'm wondering how we how do we create a new space in that? How do we use that space, the uncertain space, to create something a third way? So it's not home, it's not school, or it's not home, it's not a, it's not university, but something that merges between. So my reality at the moment often is doing a tutorial or doing something online and my two-year-old comes in and needs to sit on my knee. <laughs> you know, and it's just these kind of, that, that is so unexpected. And so that my ideas of who I am and what identity I have at that time is so permeable that I'm wondering how we can use these ideas to move forward into something that creates something new rather than just falling into what we knew were the certainties beforehand, which was home on one side and school on the other, or university on one side and um, home on the other. So I think it's, it's this idea of 
the, the creativity and these kind of discussions are so helpful, I think, but how, how do we move forward with the new thinking without being sucked back into the old ways that, that we do when we're trying to seek certainty? I think you're so muted, Harley. Thank you for that. Oh, I'm, I'm asking this eventually, but the, uh, um, yeah, just uh, I, I, what you were saying made me think, or I've been thinking anyway, that um, I'm wondering as a non-teacher, how much the Easter break has given people a chance to sort of reflect and think about the way forward, or whether it's actually been a genuine break or people have just sort of collapsed in a heap after the last few weeks. Um, before moving on to you know stop term starts again but anyway um so claire um fox you are up next and you have been unmuted uh thank you um a very interesting discussion um i was reflecting on what uh susan i think susan parler said uh from northern ireland um about how so much of this is just not fit for purpose and trying to sort you know make it work when it's not really the same and the reason I wanted to stress it's not the same is because colleagues um, at the BOI charity have been uh, very usefully launched debating matters, the sixth form debating competition using Zoom. Great success because it's interactive and the students themselves are able to participate and so on. People are clamoring to have more and more. And it, and it gets to this point where people start saying, oh, we could do everything via Zoom as though somehow we should make a virtue out of what is actually a desperate situation. And the reason I raise that is because of course it's not the same. We should of course try and deal with this terrible crisis using whatever tools we can. And as Toby has pointed out, we have an obligation to teach and to educate young people. But I do think that Joe Nutt raised a very interesting point in his contribution um, when he said that there are people who are trying to use this necessity to push through an ideological shift in terms of how we view education by the back door to sort of say, oh, look, you see, this has proved all along that teachers were doing the wrong thing, that teachers are just technicians, really, that this is that learning is just a skill, that the teachers are, you know, the, the guide at the side, not the sage on the stage, all of this sort of stuff. And also, if you look at the debate in terms of higher education, there's seriously discussions now about, oh, well, there we go. That just shows that we don't really need to have all that university malarkey. We could do a lot of it online. The quality can be maintained and so on. So my concern is that whereas it's right that Donald says we shouldn't fetishize either the classroom or fetishize uh, technology, that this particular period is being used to actually cheat politically by trying to imply that we should draw certain conclusions without them being debated by trying to make a virtue of how we're coping in extraordinary uh, circumstances. And I'd like to just reflect on that. I don't, I think it's no doubt about it that the kids are enjoying it. Let me tell you at the Academy of Ideas, we're having daily Zoom meetings and we're having better political discussions every morning than we would do if we walked into the office and grumpily made a cup of coffee for each other or didn't even talk to each other. But does that mean I want coronavirus and Zoom meetings every morning? And do I think that this is a wonderful period in my life? No, I bloody well don't. We're locked in. It's socially awful. And I think that whilst we can make the best of it, we should not try and celebrate it as some kind of new era that we should not go back to the past. Okay, and then um, on we have Fiona McEwen next. Hi, um, so I, I, I work at a university, but predominantly in research rather than teaching, but I also have two kids. Um, but I'm in the, the slightly um, privileged position at the moment of having spent the last two and a bit years working on a project where we've been adapting um, psychological therapy to be delivered over the phone. Um, and this is because we're working with uh, Syrian refugees in Lebanon and a major problem there is that many families can't get to clinics. So we've been, we've been taking a sort of face-to-face -face treatment and then adapting it to be delivered over the phone. Um, so obviously therapy is not the same as education, but where there are parallels, I think, are in the, the process we had to go through to think about how to make something work over the phone um, and not even using video technology. So, you know, it's the most basic level of technology. 
um, one, I suppose one of the things we had to do at the outset was to, to break down every component of what would normally happen in a session and think what's happening and what the purpose is, you know, from the, you know, just the little things that happen automatically at, you know, at the very beginning, there needs to be rapport building. And then if you can't do that in the normal sort of face to face way, you then have to think of how you do that over the phone, um, which then involves thinking, you know, you, you're not just going to replicate the same thing and do it over the phone, you have to come up with a completely different way of doing it. So in our case, it would be you know, sort of finding little games that, you know, that work over the phone and things like that. You know, so for every single step, we had to, to do that and think of a completely alternative way to deliver that particular part of the process. Um, but it's it took us probably a good year and a half to, to do that, you know, from, from taking our initial manual, breaking it down like that, sort of working out how to do it, then piloting it, then realising, you know, working out all the stuff that didn't work so well and then changing it and so on, and then eventually sort of rolling out into a trial. So it's taken a good year and a half to do that. And, it, you know, it's a very difficult, laborious process. And the mistake would have been just thinking, well, we take the, the sort of the, the sessions as they are and then just try and do exactly the same with the phone. You know, it just doesn't work like that. So I, I'm acutely aware of the fact that teachers at the moment effectively have been thrown into that situation of sort of having everything that would normally happen in the classroom and just being expected to somehow sort of chuck it online. Um, but, it, you know, it, it was a really um, in-depth process, process to get to that point. Um, and I think one of the things that's really key is actually, you know, it's not the technology, it's the skill of the councillors in that situation is even greater than, you know, at least as important, if not greater than it would be in a face-to-face -face setting, because it's actually about them being able to innovate um, and then being able to build that rapport and then being able to build those relationships and so on. And, you know, that has to happen remotely um, you know, in a similar way, but you know, it's it's very much their skill that drives that process forwards. Um, so I just I feel like the you know there's maybe some sort of parallels in the process that we had to go through in terms of what teachers might need to be thinking about now. Yeah, thank you. Um, really interesting. Um, so we've got Richard Wolfenden, um, then Shirley Laws, uh, and Teach Smith, and then we're going to come back to Donald and Toby, and then we should be able to come out for one more round from the audience. So, um, Richard, I'm uh, unmuting you now. Uh, thank you. I'm a, a English teacher and a acting head of sixth form in uh, East London. Um, I'd just like to take up something that Donald said and um, about people being wrong-footed pedagogically and I, I just I want to question that idea um, did we have all the tech ready when schools were closed down did we have all the online systems speaking for my own school no we didn't we had a system ready to be used but had we gone through that process no so I've got a lot of sympathy with uh, the points that um, Susan was making from Northern Ireland that we're having to find our feet a bit and some of the technology doesn't really work. But as an English teacher, I want to try and I'll make some mistakes. And I've already made quite a few, but I want to try and do things that I would normally do when I'm teaching. Uh, and I want to read literature with my students and discuss it. I will do it in a smaller way. Um, I want to try and emulate some of the, copy some of the things I do in the classroom. I'll work out and we can have a discussion about how successful that is, but that's the way that I judge whether my students are engaged and they're thinking about literature. So I can't completely kick out Zoom as a, as a way of connecting and teaching uh, with, um, uh, with, with my students. And that means there's a lot of experimenting, a lot of ad hoc uh, um, uh, lessons going on at the moment where we will probably reject some of it but I think uh, it's important that we have a spirit of experimentation in these difficult times. So three weeks ago we read The Dumb Waiter by Pinter. It took us about an hour and a half, two hours over uh, online but it was, it, was, it was worth the experiment. I used to do a lot of filming for Bechter uh, when Bechter the Quango was still existing and film all their kind of best practice. I remember being in a classroom uh, where the teacher had got everybody involved in second life. Does everybody remember that? He thought getting students involved in a virtual world was a way of educating students. And it, uh, we were filming the students at the time. And I remember this moment when the teacher said uh, they were in an underwater scenario by a, by a treasure chest. And the teacher stopped the class and said, 
someone has hidden the key to the treasure chest. This lesson cannot go on. Um, so it was a very funny moment and we've probably learned quite a lot in the last 10 years of whether we can actually use virtual spaces to learn. Um, but I think we have to have some kind of spirit of experimentation uh, in very, very difficult situations. But boy, do I want to be back in front of my students, looking them in the eye and uh, teaching them and imposing certain uh, authority uh, to that situation. Thanks, Richard. Um, so, Shirley, uh, I should say that um, people, I don't know if people have spotted, but there's a lot of um, good comments being made on the chat, which are worth looking at. Um, Donald, uh, you've made a lot of interesting ones, but I think you made them directly to me. I'm not sure if that was intentional, but they, they all seem like suitable for a public audience. Um, but uh, Shirley, you, you've been unmuted. Shirley Laws, you are next. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd agree very much with a lot of what people have been saying and I think we just need to be really clear about how this has been thrust upon teachers without with very little time to either find out how to re you know to readjust and and um, I have to say repackage probably um, but also I think because if you think if you look at uh, good online stuff I've been involved in a couple of years ago in writing a MOOC, a massive online um, open course. And, um, you know, people spend months developing that. And they also spend a lot of time actually monitoring and working on it while it's um, actually being, while it's going out to the thousands of people that that particularly does. Now, teachers haven't had that time. And I think some have, have not really had, um, haven't had the means to, to really think about how you, I mean, unlike Richard, perhaps haven't been given the freedom to be able to, to be more inventive and be more creative. And at the same time, I, I you know, so I, I, I think I agree with Claire about not making a virtue out of a necessity, but I do think that probably in many cases, the worst case, uh, you know, the, worst, the lowest possible denominator has been adopted and it's just like homework after homework after homework, and it could be better. But I do think that we've uh, two things are really important. So the time needed we haven't had, or teachers haven't had. But I think, yeah, and, and, but the limitations I think have to are both practical and intellectual. And I think you particularly see that once you start talking about more abstract knowledge rather than information. And again, I've heard conversations where knowledge and information are being completely conflated. Um, and in a sense, we lose knowledge at the expense of, of, of or at least in, in focusing on information getting across. And I think that is a li real limitation. And I also think, following on from what Richard was saying, that what you lose in online learning is a spontaneity. I've, a few years ago, worked on MA courses that were online. And you, the, the depth and quality of discussion amongst people, albeit I, I know that technology has improved now, but nevertheless, it's a much more limited experience, I think. And when you then transfer that to young people and very small children, I, I, I think you, you have to acknowledge that there, is a, there are real limitations. Um, I also think, as, as I think Joanne was saying, that it has this situation has exposed some of the weaknesses in our education system. Not least that because we have a very sort of packaged exam orientated process that, student, that students go through, teachers in a sense have lost their, author, their autonomy in being able to think, how am I going to do this? And, you know, for every Richard that I, I just love listening to what he was saying, what he's been doing. For every Richard, there's going to be a dozen people who are just doing what senior or middle management are telling them to do and just dishing out pre-packaged stuff that kids aren't going to get much out of. So uh, your point about, um, you know, teachers not having the time to be creative, it is interesting, there's a few stars um, or, uh, 
emerging out of this um, situation. So I don't know if people know um, or have heard about Holly King Maud Mand, I think it is, Holly King Mand, uh, lady who um, did sort of uh, started filming her little I English uh, lessons and putting them on Facebook. And she had a few, few hundred followers a few weeks ago. She's now got um, 30,000 as of today. So it'd be interesting to see if those people stay um stick around uh, when we get back i just while i think of it i just wanted to come back on something claire said earlier when you were um when you were talking claire about um you know the people who've had a sort of ideological view of technical ed tech for a long time hoping that they've um sort of won the argument by uh, by this by dint of circumstance um what i've actually been a little bit surprised that most of the usual suspects who who make all the arguments about um ed education being wrong and it, and the answer to everything is personalized learning and and uh, 24 hour uh, 24 7 learning and 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 so on um they've kind of gone a bit quiet um as far as i've seen uh, and i don't know if that's because they think they've won the argument or they're a bit worried they might lose it because of the 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 hatred coming um, their way or the way of the technology at the moment. But anyway, that's just an observation. Um, be interested to hear what other people think. So we're just going to do uh, Teach Smith um, and then we'll go back to Donald and Toby and then we'll come out again. Uh, teach, if that's Hello. your name. You have Hello, is that all right? Yeah. Am I yeah. my body, volleyball? Uh, yeah. Yeah, sorry, my, name, my name's Dan Smith. Uh, so it's just my email address. Uh, I'm a secondary school English teacher um, in Red Hill. Um, just quite, uh, I'll rattle for you a few, a few things. Um, just wanted to pick up on a few things briefly. Yes, um, we were thrown into it far too uh, rushed. Um, the expectation was just to replicate the classroom um, online, which was wrong. Um, fortunately, my head of department was excellent and she kind of um, sort of stood firm in the task that we set, um, which I think are much more suitable uh, basically we set um, some reading um, at the start of the week and um, some scaffolding through questioning um, and then they have to respond to that in written form by the end of the week so they have the whole week to do that um, it has been positive um, still not 100 percent participation but it has been positive a um, couple of other things to say um, secondly uh, this technology thing um, there's a few issues i think with why uh, perhaps it hasn't been taken up um, I think there was a kind of rush to technology um, at the start of my teaching career. I've uh, been a teacher for 10 years um, and it was kind of technology for technology's sake. Um, that doesn't mean it's a bad thing. I just think that teachers became jaded and they became cynical uh, because this technology was thrown at them to say, this is good because it's technology. That does not mean it's a bad thing. Uh, I want to give an example of good technology. Um, for example, our year sevens are working with a piece of software called Bedrock. Um, they do vocabulary lessons each week. It's um, tuned, it's, it's, it's adapted to their ability level and it's absolutely fantastic. But it took months, it took months for the student to get used to the technology, to that, for that to become a habit and a routine. And it took uh, teachers as guidance and mentors um, to work them through that. It can't just be immediate. Um, finally, I'd just like to say it's a real shame um, there's been some quite negative representations of the classroom. Um, certainly there is problems with disruption and behavior in this, in this country. I mean, it's a serious issue. However, that doesn't mean that um, we should give up on the classroom and the classroom works is absolutely fantastic. You're talking about schools like Michaela, Bedford, Bedford Free School. Um, and, and, and if I may say my own classroom, you know, I've had breakthroughs with students um, that are just, life transforming you know and and that happened because of the classroom that because because building relationships with with me and with their peers um painstakingly over months um so i think that there is a place for technology but let's not hollow out the classroom let's not say well there's behavior problems and we're on lockdown anyway what it, you know the the classroom can be so valuable the behaviour thing is a separate cultural issue, I think, and it needs addressing. But that's not, let's not say just because there's cultural issues that we should somehow hollow out the classroom because it can be a transformative space. Thank you for that. So um, we are back now with uh, Donald. If you'd like to pick up on uh, anything that's been said um, or indeed typed, 
Uh, go for it. An interesting theme has emerged in the debate, a good debate, which is, you know, over one side we have these, uh, I think, a mythical group of ed tech people who hate classrooms, want to shut down all schools and are in it for the money. And over here, there's a very virtuous group of people who want to defend classrooms and hate tech. In actual fact, I don't think either of those two groups is representative of us as a whole. I've, I've been in this industry for 35 years. I, don't, I literally know no one who wants to close down schools and classrooms. No one. Steve Jobs was fanatically all for schools, didn't allow tech into the hands of his kids. And no one says hollow out or get rid of classrooms. But, but there is a sense in which if you even criticise anything that happens in a classroom, you're a sort of tech corporate ogre. <laughs> and I think that's a theme that's emerged here a little bit, to be honest. You know, I'm all for classrooms, I'm all for schools. But I don't think you should censor people just because they think that classrooms are not the best place to socialize kids, for example, uh, and that there are real problems with behavior and so on and so forth. And I think the, the guy from Red Hill, I think you're right. We need a balance here. And most people, I would say, sensibly come down the middle. I think Joe's been on about this for years. And I think Claire also, you, know, you, you can't just demonize everybody in working in tech as if they want to destroy schools. Hardly any of them do. In fact, many of them want to help, uh, uh, very generously trying to help uh, teachers do better, taking workload off them, uh, additive rather than destructive in terms of the schools thing. I mean, technology has been a massive boon for people. I mean, in those kids with disabilities, for example, you know, who would do without technology if you have learning, if you have hearing difficulties, uh, sight difficulties and so, so forth. In my life, I've seen the democratization of education in the third world in higher education. Every year, kids who never even met another student on their course or their tutor, in tears at the graduation ceremonies, they come along to. We have to get away from this idea that being in a classroom is always a necessary condition for learning. That's the only criticism. It's not. There are plenty of other contexts in which people do learn here. Uh, no one's saying close the classroom down. Uh, no one's saying that, but we are saying let's think innovatively about improving or do things that you cannot do in a classroom. The personalized learning is very, very difficult in classrooms. And perhaps there is room for both here. And that's what people are asking for here. But there's a deep anti-corporate, anti-tech thing in the teacher community. And there's, you know, that's what people are saying. And then there's a deep anti-tech, uh, uh, you know, there's an assumed anti-schools, anti-classroom thing in the tech community. I don't think that's absolute, that's true actually. We're all people, most of us have been parents, most of us actually taught uh, ki young kids. So I, I, my fear here is that we just dichotomize this. That, um, thank you, Donald. And uh, you just reminded me, I've been doing a lot of reading about history of education and particularly the uh, Victorian era of schools when they were really starting to take shape, the modern schools starting to take shape. And at that point, a lot of the schools, they did the teaching in the morning and in the afternoon, they did the other stuff, which was much more open-ended. And maybe there's an opportunity, maybe, you know, we think about schools in that way, but that's a big question. Um, so, uh, Toby Marshall, um, you have been unmuted. Please give us your thoughts. Uh, sorry, sometime lucky. You've been unmuted. Okay, now. Yeah, we can hear, hear oh, you. Now. Yeah. No, thank you. Um, yeah, it's a very um, interesting discussion. I just, uh, I suppose, I just wanted to endorse. Um, what I think Shirley was pointing to, which is, um, uh, and this is a, you know, it's a positive and a negative, it's a slight scary thing. Um, I mean, it just throws into sharp relief your professionalism as a teacher um, changed uh, circumstances. And, um, you know, I think there has been a, uh, a hollowing out of the profession um, intellectually. Uh, because of the withdrawal of teacher education um, and I think um, a lot of the new structures um, associated with school um, are not very collegiate um, and don't encourage uh, professional autonomy and decision making um, and you know we've moved towards increasingly the scripted lesson the downloaded lesson um, and all of those things and I think um, you know um, it's going to cause a lot of anxiety in a situation where a lot of those old routines um, 
uh, can't be applied because of a changed um, circumstance. Um, but nothing's fixed and it's also an opportunity, isn't it, for people to recapture their professionalism um, through experimentation. Um, and I, I, I said, I'm not a technologist, I'm just an enthusiast, I enjoy it um, myself. Um, but one point I would make is that, I mean, I've been in teaching for 20 years um, and it is testimony to the utility of um, uh, educational technologies that they have become ubiquitous. And I think it's easy to forget the extent to which, uh, or, or it's, it's easy to um, not, not see the extent to which they have become a ubiquitous part of the way in which we communicate uh, and educate and um, uh, they're in all parts of our life. And, uh, you know, so they've brought a great deal um, to, to the way that we do things. And I think it's important that we um, recognize that. I, although I have found, um, uh, you know, people, comments that people made about the technology embodying a certain value and an attempt to transition education to something that is more reduced and less humanist. Um, uh, an interesting one um, for, uh, um, you know, one to watch really and to guard against uh, because the technology can become a technopoly as Neil Postman kind of talks about and that's an important thing to kind of keep it keep in mind. Um, but we are where we are and um, I'm up for the uh, the Soviet approach to technology as opposed to the American approach. Just keep it simple as much as you can. Um, don't, don't invent a zero gravity pen, just take a pencil instead. Um, and, you know, and, and don't, don't lose sight of the fact that you're making cultural decisions um, in this new space. Um, and it doesn't have to be all whiz bang and, you know, really clever. Um, I mean, I said, I thought I had a great few lessons with admittedly my more engaged students, um, you know, using uh, we basically we're just watching um, the same video uh, together and then having a discussion about it. And I think that was about as good as you could get really in film studies. Um, I don't think, you know, massive new technology uh, beyond that would have added a great deal to that experience. So um, I'm up for keeping it simple and, and, and just trying lots and lots of things and, and seeing what works in this context. Um, there was a survey came out, um, Teacher Tap, which uh, surveys several thousand teachers every day on various questions. They came out, they've been sort of tracking what people have been doing um, during the crisis, what teachers have been doing. And they've said that sort of as it's moved on, teachers originally started doing exactly what you described, just PowerPoints and, and worksheets and, and so on, um, PDFs. But they're now starting to see a few signs that people are being a bit more experimental and creative and trying online meet, um, videos and, and you know, meetings like the one we're in now and, and so on. So, uh, but you know, obviously other people might have things to say about that too. Um, so we, as I said, last opportunity to speak, we've got Kate and Joe who've both spoken before. If anyone else wants to put their hands up, and I'm oh, sorry, I've got Alco who's going to go next. And, um, uh, and then I might say something as well. Uh, and then we'll go back to, uh, our speakers. Alco, you're un unmuted. Okay, thank you all. So I, I'm uh, currently teaching in an educational charity where I teach with a, literally a whiteboard and a pen and a few textbooks if I'm lucky. Um, and I'm now trying to get to grips with uh, some of the technology to plan class online lessons, classes after Easter. Um, so uh, what I'm going to say is not really about the use of the actual, if you like, the use of technology. It, it can be used in a good or bad way just as I think somebody said you've got good or bad teaching. Um, but I think the, there's two points I want to, do want to pick up on. One is the socialization question and the, and the role of classrooms and schools, perhaps more broadly. Um, and also the question on why can't we do both and how could, you know, how can we, how can we use the technology better? So on the socialization, I think at the minute, there's quite a bit of confusion. People seem to be talking about socialization as if it were good behavior. And I think there's a difference because um, when you're talking about the, the social role of schools, it's not about kind of, you know, good, easy behavior or behavior you need for learning. It's about um, introducing the younger generation into a wider set of values and relationships than they have at home. Now, this isn't to say school trumps home or home trumps school. 
it is to say that you need both. You need the fluidity and the intimacy and the kind of personal values to do with intimate life that, that families are best equipped to give. But we also live in a society that's pluralistic, that has a lot of people with different views and ideas and beliefs to our own families. And the role schools have traditionally played, if you like, sociologically, in a sociological way, is of negotiating that betwixt, the betwixt ground between children being children at home with their personal identities, and then gradually coming into a wider range of contact with people, ideas, beliefs, values which are carefully managed via adults, professional adults we call teachers, um, where they're in that kind of semi-public, semi-private role before entering the wider social adult world, <clears throat> where they are socialized, they've been socialised not just by schools in classrooms, um, but also by parents, shopkeepers, aunts and uncles, and the whole adult society. So for that reason, I think I would want to uphold the role of, of schools and classrooms in the way Toby perhaps you were getting at it in, what you were alluding to in your speech. Now the thing on can we use technology better um, can't we have both? I mean I think we can but the problem is and this touches on what Kevin was saying is that to just pose a problem like that you're not addressing the existing problem which is the hollowing out and the deintellectualization that has happened over decades. And um, because you see, I think what, what that, if you just go with how can we use it better, what you'll get is a lot of focus and attention. How can we train up teachers to use Zoom, to use you know, Google Classrooms and all the rest of it better? And, and I, I would like that for sure. I would like to be better technically, but that is only really half at most, if not a quarter of the, what is needed. Because what is also needed is teachers need to be able to know their subject really well to know which parts of their subject can be best taught technically and which parts of their subject need to be, really do need that um, personal interface and the, the collective aspect of being in a class. At the minute, we don't even think of our subjects or knowledge in that way. So there's a lot of prior okay. intellectual work that needs to be done as well as the wider, broader question of values. What is education for? What is our model of the teacher that is being um, advocated when we say we can have education provided along this line or that line? What is the model of the teacher? Once we've got, that, once we've got a clearer okay. idea of that, then we can bring in technology in a helpful way. Okay, thanks, Alka. So in the last few minutes, so we've got Kate and Joe, if you can be quite quick with you, um, especially as you've already spoken. I'm going to say something brief, and then we've got Ian, hopefully we'll have time for just to finish things off before to uh, Donald and Toby. Uh, so, uh, Kate, over to you. Well, Alka was, uh, made, a made the point much more brilliantly than I could. I just think that the fact that schools are a bridge between the private and the public, but they are neither. And we do need that space because they are only children and they need a place to be able to um, learn how to be grown ups, and that is part of it. But I, my, I've got two questions. The first is, um, are people finding um, that they are having to uh, teach the parents? Because we're having to do little notes about things so that it's um, the reason why I'm doing all these things with my hands is because I'm teaching reverse sweep or whatever it may be. Um, so are people finding that? And is that right? Should they have to do that? Because there is a division of labor and they're, pl you know, they could be plumbers mm -hmm. or lawyers or whatever they are. And the second thing is, is that are there subject differences? So some mm -hmm. subjects um, it's kind of alluding to what um, Alka was saying about which bits of content, but there must be some subjects that are better suited. Yeah. Um, that, so language language is, is notoriously one that, and maths are two that have always been, uh, people have generally made work quite well with online, but it'd be interesting to hear what people are doing now. Joe, thanks for that. Joe, um, quickly from you. Yeah, very, yeah, very briefly. I think, you know, I think what Kevin said was absolutely spot on. Uh, I just really reiterate the, the sort of point I made at the beginning. Uh, you know, the last couple of weeks, uh, people have been approaching me who haven't spoken to me in years. And uh, the, the ups, the sort of 
amount of energy that's been put into this by big and powerful organizations and influential organizations i haven't seen anything like this since you know i left the classroom uh, and and really they they are only interested in the technology and the kinds of coalitions they formed are remarkable you know look at they, some of these organizations that are coming together have not been together before uh, and they're all the they're all the you know the kind of people you'd expect the world bank has just released millions of dollars for for uh, promoting technology projects that they just found out of the back of a cupboard you know in the last week so there's a big change here that I haven't seen before, and I would really just stress that. I think it, it, it's, it's different. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, I'm just going to say a couple, very quick couple things about, um, well, one is EdTech and one is a parent. So from my experience of EdTech, we used to be very, we used to do uh, quite simply videos and activities for use in the classroom. Um, very proud of what we did. Uh, but it always amazed us when we went into the classroom that we'd see that teachers had done stuff with it that we never expected. And often we'd take that stuff and then put it back into the product. Um, another thing we learned when we first, uh, we always wanted them to be using it. We loved it. We wanted them to be using it all the time, every lesson, etc. And when we got a research team, the first thing they discovered was that actually teachers would be using it once or twice a week. And as far as they were concerned, they thought that was great. Uh, it wasn't enough for us, but actually, from teacher's point of view, um, they were using it completely appropriately and they were very happy with it. So um, there's a difference maybe of a view between the ed tech people and the people, the, the, the people in the classroom. Um, and then as a parent, just to say, one of the things about um, online, we did a debate, um, the Battle of Ideas, about uh, technology versus tech books a couple of years ago. A point was made, it was stuck in my mind, uh, that uh, one thing about textbooks is they're very physical. You can see what see them, you know exactly what you've got with them. And as parents, the things we've found most difficult about this whole experience is having no clue about what it is that our son has got to do because every teacher uses the technology in a slightly different way fair enough but it's um it's very slippery and difficult to get a sense of so anyway that's my points and then ian you're the last one we're going to hear from before we go back to the speakers uh if i can unmute you there you go okay thanks um a quick point really um that it seemed to me that this would have been a good opportunity to um put some expectation on the learners and and decide what we expect of them uh, and when this lockdown happened, it occurred to me that um, this would be a great opportunity for students, particularly secondary school age, but younger too, um, to do some independent reading. Um, it seemed to me that if we were a nation of readers, if, we, if, if, if that was something that was embedded in the education system, um, it, it would have solved a lot of problems. It would have aided a lot of learning. Um, and... I think it, I think this is is an opportunity to reflect on that a bit. That um, we don't know how long this is going to last, but in, in as far as it does last, the more young people are reading, I think the better off they're going to be in their education. Because I think when they're working at home, their independence is pretty crucial, and that's that's reading is one way in which you can be independent as a learner. Thank you. Great, great. Thank you. Um, so. Donald and Toby, last, uh, just very quick, final summit killer point that you want to make in response to anything that's been said or typed this evening. Donald, you're first. Yeah, I thought that was a really interesting point about the learners in that last one. In fact, I was that was the very point I was going to make here. I think I'm a great fan of John White's educational theory, which is ultimately education is about producing autonomous human beings. And that's why school and schooling is so important. It needs, as many teachers have pointed out, a nurturing, protected environment, a bridge in the real world. However, you can't just hold people up in classrooms right to the last minute, then throw them into the wide, wide world. And I think the process of opening up autonomy in learning, which is really difficult, is best served by taking cognizance of technology as part of the mix here because these kids every last one of them almost has a device in their pocket now when they leave school they will be using this in the workplace in their homes and it's our duty really to use what they use and induce the autonomy when you go to university they don't actually sit in classrooms Unfortunately, the sit in lecture theatres, well, only 60% of them do because 40% drop out after, six, uh, after four months. 
And then a se only second point I would make about, you know, the, I would hope that we come out of this with a bit of suspicion about, as Kevin rightly said, the sort of globalization of this fixed formulaic view of education. Uh, you know, I would hope that we don't spend 30 billion in the EU on the Erasmus program flying rich kids around Europe. I would hope that we scrap that fund and actually spend it on technology for the poorer kids who don't have access to that type of education. I would hope that that 30 billion was taken online. I would hope that we don't prop up our higher education system by flying rich Chinese students in by the plane load. I would hope that we get more local and we pay more attention to the poorer kids here in this country and the people who need the help that technology often gives them. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and then Toby, um, you've gone missing again, but I've just found you. Here you are unmuted. Give us no. your final thoughts. Um, well, is it a um, threat or um, an opportunity? Um, I, I think we do have to be mindful of um, what Joe has been saying um, and you know, just keep on our guard, those of us who want to defend a uh, knowledge-centric, humanist um, education uh, because a, a, a crisis is an opportunity to um, bypass all kinds of um, discussions that would ordinarily um, happen. Um, but I think it's also an opportunity for us um, as teachers to show what we're made of and to demonstrate our purpose and uh, to make clear, um, you know, why society pays our wages. So I think, you know, that's an opportunity as well. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm positive about that. And um, I'd like to leave on a, on, on a positive note. So I've just Googled uplifting quotes for times of apocalypse. Um, and this has come, come up. So I'll read you this. I like this um, quote. Um, and if anyone can guess who it is, that'd be great. Um, Faced with crisis, the man of character falls back on himself. He imposes his own stamp of action, takes responsibility for it, and makes it his own. Anybody guess who that is? Charles de Gaulle. There we go. Ah, excellent. Um, okay, well, just before we thank our speakers, um, everybody, I'm just going to make a couple of announcements, um, very short ones. Fact, I'm going to bring, um, hopefully, if I can do this, bring uh, something back on screen just uh, as a visual aid. Um, so uh, there you hopefully go. Um, so, yeah, so I hope you found this session interesting, enjoyable. It's never ideal, as we know, but, um, but uh, hopefully we've kind of made it work. Um, if you'd like to know about future education forum events, please do sign up to our mailing list, which you can do by dropping us a line at education at academyofideas.org.uk. Now, um, we don't often arrive at an answer in these discussions, uh, and tonight I think it's no different. Um, I'm going to sit um, down and read through all the chat comments straight after I've done this. Uh, there's a lot being going on there, but we hope we have stimulated lots of productive thought. Um, that may inspire you as, the, 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 as we go back into the new term. So normally at this point, we would all head down the pub to continue the discussion. But as that's not possible, feel free to post any thoughts to our Facebook group, uh, perhaps with a glass of whiskey in your hand. Uh, so keep an eye out for the recording, which will be going up on the website soon. Um, in the meantime, I'm just going to take everyone off mute uh, and thank everyone for coming. So please, uh, thanks to you all for coming and please show your appreciation for our speakers. Thank you. Thank you.